joining us today. I'm really excited based on the pre-chat that we had very briefly with Rob and Peter. I'm very excited that this will be an entertaining hour that we're going to spend here. Um, and like uh, Peter is always good for controversy, which I know from the past. So I'm very curious to hear which opinion he has on a topic that I'm sure that a lot of people in Romania about like remote work have, have strong experiences because I think especially in the Romanian ecosystem, like almost everybody has at some point in time been involved in some form of remote work. Um, but before we'll dive into our topic, I uh, want to let the uh, two panelists uh, give a quick chance to introduce themselves. So Peter, why, why don't you start and give a quick intro about what, what are you up to lately and um, yeah, a little bit of your background. And I can go then after the, the boasting and share how awesome you are. Um, but maybe you can start and give a quick intro to yourself. Okay, thanks, Philip. Super appreciate it. Um, well, yeah, I've, uh, currently I'm a founder and CEO of a company called In Country, uh, where we do global data management and privacy. So we have uh, points of presence in over 90 countries, and we enable SaaS companies to store data in its point of origin. Uh, so we work primarily with uh, vendors like Salesforce and ServiceNow that need to store, uh, you know, their customers need to store their data in a variety of locations. Uh, you know, in Europe, for example, Privacy Shield has broken down. So U.S. Uh, SaaS companies have to store data in Europe, but this is already happening in China, Russia, Indonesia, Vietnam. A lot of countries mandate that their citizens' data be stored and processed within those countries, sort of a deglobalization data privacy theme. Uh, the company, uh, we just announced yesterday actually that we raised an additional $18 million. So the company is 90 people. We've raised $40 million total. Uh, so far, it's uh, 20 months old. Uh, Rob is an investor. So we're very fortunate to have him involved uh, since the early, the early days when that was still a crazy idea. Um, and the team, uh, you know, we have offices worldwide. So we actually only have uh, six people in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm based. We have an office in Minsk, which is undergoing some turmoil right now. Some, some of you may know in Belarus, uh, Rostov on Don, St. Petersburg, Singapore, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, you know, Sydney. So it's a pretty, pretty wide global footprint for the company. Uh, previously, I've started six other enterprise infrastructure companies since the early 90s. Uh, fortunate that they were all acquired one way or another by uh, Sun Microsystems, uh, Oracle, Citrix, companies like that. And then I was also the uh, CIO of CBS, which is a TV network in the U.S. Uh, and actually owned a lot of websites. Uh, my job there was to consolidate all the assets uh, and move the uh, company into the cloud. There's my quick uh, background. Uh, I grew up overseas, actually, primarily in Europe. Uh, and uh, now I'm in San Francisco. Uh, uh, so you, yeah, go ahead, Rob. No, you go ahead, Philip. No, 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 please. I just wanted to, 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 to ask you to do an intro piece as well. So please go ahead. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but uh, Buna Siada. Um, and... <laughs> Um, my name is Rob Bailey. I'm currently the CEO and co-founder of Backbone AI. Uh, I'm not nearly as accomplished as Peter, uh, but uh, I've been busy. So I've built $100 million companies a few times. A um, little known fact, a previous company I built, uh, DataSift, uh, where I was CEO for three years. Uh, Peter is one of our first customers, and he was actually on our homepage of our website uh, for, for a few months, which is how we first got to know each other. Um, Backbone AI is intercompany data automation for supply chains. There's $25 trillion worth of supply chains in the world. And believe it or not, most of them have pretty good systems internally, but huge data silos. So you have massive publicly traded companies that are responsible for a lot of the goods that you may eat or use every day that are actually sending data back and forth to each other using email and Excel spreadsheets, which is crazy. So what we're doing is providing an intelligent connective layer that connects different data silos together in supply chains around the world so that companies can deliver products to end customers like all of you uh, faster and more reliably. Uh, we're VC funded. Uh, we've raised uh, close to 7 million, uh, mostly from US VCs. Uh, we have about a third of our team in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, I think maybe more. Um, with the focus, we actually have listed a uh, office in Bucharest on our website. 
And uh, we also have some folks in the Cluj area as well. Um, so uh, had, I was planning on, before COVID, was planning on spending a lot of time in Romania. And um, now I have to wait a little bit, but uh, we are very long on, uh, on Romania and love the team members that we have in, in, in Romania. Uh, personally, I'm based in New York City. And uh, I grew up also, uh, like Peter, I spent the uh, first part of my life overseas in Europe, Italy, and England, and then in Latin America, Mexico, and Brazil. Th thanks very much, Rob and Peter. I mean, if there's like any like definition of serial entrepreneur um, needed, then like both of you really meet this, right? Like, so be before we go into the audience question, right? Like what I'm really impressed is like, how, how do you guys manage to have the energy to do this like over and over again, right? Like, I mean, Peter, you said like six exits of six companies, which is an amazing track record, but how, how do you have the energy to do it over and over again? Or, or would you just be bored if you wouldn't do it anymore? So you do this like until like, until you're like seventies or so. Uh, every time I convince myself it'll be easier than the last time. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, women forget what it's like to have a baby and then they have another. Right? <laughs> so they say. Oh, that's not okay, right. six, six, six babies and you're willing to get the seventh. That's pretty hardcore, Peter. So that's like. Uh, uh, I like it. It's fun. You know, uh, I, I like the formation part of companies. I can just see the headline now. Peter Yared has had six babies. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, uh, I just feel incredibly blessed and lucky to do what I do, which is, you know, finding big, messy, shitty problems and then solving them using technology and companies um, and working with uh, incredibly smart people um, that are very talented in tech, marketing and product. Um, and if you do a good job solving the problem, one, you solve the problem and make the world a better place. And two, you know, you potentially make some good money. So. Um, I feel incredibly blessed and lucky to do what I do. It doesn't feel like work. That's, that's awesome. And that's like how exactly how it should be. So then we're, we're rolling into the uh, audience questions. And I want to say that like for the people on the Zoom call, if you have other questions, I mean, please feel free to put it in the chat or like put your video on. Um, I mean, we can take live questions. If you're, on, uh, if you're listening in on Facebook, I'm not sure if you can take questions, but you could jump on the Zoom anytime um, and then like ask questions, right? Like we really wanna make this interactive and get the maximum value out of having such accomplished entrepreneurs with Rob and Peter there. So, I mean, please do, do ask questions. We have a few uh, that were already coming in and we'll start with those, but I mean, definitely do add and we'll, we'll uh, ask them once we're through with the ones that were sent in by the audience before. So the first question was, um, how, how did you find your co-founders and how did, how did you put your first team together? Rob, do you wanna, you wanna go and uh, share on that? Yes. So I started coding at 12 uh, and coded in a bunch of different languages and realized over and over again that I was absolutely terrible at coding. Uh, so I ended up probably more on the product and business side. Uh, so when I started Backbone, I had to find a co-founder so initially I actually found a guy through um, some of our investors uh, that had built a bunch of companies um, and actually had experience building engineering teams overseas. So um, it was introductions through investors. So you found, you found your Wozniak basically, right? Like how Jobs found his like partner in crime. Something like that, yeah. Did, did you work out of curiosity? Did you work together with the guy after you did the first thing or was it like kind of like the, the, the person that you worked with the start or did you like collaborate for the long year? Career? We're still working together. Oh, wow. That, that is awesome. That's fantastic. Peter, how about you? You know, uh, first few startups, uh, you know, like Rob, I started coding when I was about nine or 10. Um, so I just coded them myself end to end. Uh, I had an end-to-end -end prototype before I recruited other people. Uh, the last three uh, I've done with a guy, Mark Reiser, that together in the early 90s, we like wrote a web server and stuff like that. So we've known each other a long time. Uh, and so uh, Postano, Sappho, Postano, which was acquired by Sprinkler, Tiger Logic, and then Sprinkler. And then Sappho, which was just acquired by Citrix a couple of years ago for over $20 million. 
And then this company, we've done all three of these together from the very beginning. Um, and he's in Michigan. I, I, I love it. Like, I mean, having said, like building a web server somewhat dates you, but I mean, it's still a very cool thing. And I, 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 given, given like the very crappy like HTTP standards, I can see how this can be a lifelong bonding experience. So I can, I can relate to that. It was the uh, multi-threading was actually a little more painful than uh, HTTP back then. HTTP in like 1993 was pretty simple. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but like people didn't really implement the standards well. Anyway, I, 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 remember, I, I remember implementing some of those things myself. Anyway. Um, so let's go on with uh, to the topic of our, our talk with um, basically like how do you make remote teams effective and the, the question is what are the best practices you've used to overcome a lack of trust and cohesion within your remote teams? And Peter, you've built more teams than I have. You want to start? Yeah, no, it's interesting because, you know, my philosophy, you know, first there, 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 there are people who can, it depends what phase of the project you're in, right? When you're at the very beginning, it's very unique people that can participate in that type of environment. And, and, and the most important thing is before you start adding a bunch of people is you have something that works end to end, right? When you have like six or seven people and they're distributed and they're not face to face and you say, tell each one to build something and then try to fit it together, it's really painful. So before you start scaling that remote team, definitely have something that works end to end, even if it's a total piece of crap. And then, you know, person X is working on feature three that improves something in the end to end experience. And, and I know it's strange to say in these COVID times, but I'm a big believer in, in face to face meetings, right? Put everyone on a plane and, and, and meet in person. And so I've done that a few times now. And, and actually, I'm, I'm more in favor, as you scale a company up, of remote offices than fully distributed remote teams. Um, I think you have access to more talent. You can bring in younger people and groom them you know, up through the organization. Um, so my last company, we got up to 90 people in Prague in the Czech Republic. Uh, this company, we have 20 in Minsk and I think 30 in Rostov and then a smattering in St. Petersburg and uh, Moscow, respectively. So anyway, that's, go ahead. Out of, out of curiosity, how, how, do you, how do you pick the cities, right? Like how is it like, like Prague and then Minsk and so on? How do you pick which cities you open an office in? Uh, so my last company, uh, it's funny because at Sappho is where I realized you can't build an engineering team in San Francisco anymore because we tried. Uh, in the meantime, we had a couple contractors in Prague um, and we just started losing. And this is back in 2014. Anybody we made a job offer to, even mid-level people, you know, got countered by Google or Facebook, you know, with 50 to $100,000 more than we were paying. And we had two contractors in Prague that were doing their own startup and funding it by being our contractors. And I'd worked with one of them, uh, you know, when I was doing Transpond, right? <laughs> and the guy was great. And then their startup wasn't doing that well. They kept asking us for advice. They built a great product, but it didn't have product market fit, you know? And then finally I'm like, wait a minute, why don't we hire you two guys? So we aqua hired them and then we built the whole office around them. Um, and, and they were really sharp guys. And that's how we ended up in Prague. And it was funny for me having spent a lot of my childhood in Vienna to go to another, you know, Habsburg Empire city, <laughs> you know? It was just like nothing had changed. I'm like, oh my God, it's a time machine. I even said to them, I'm like, these look like the same trams from when I was a kid in Vienna. And they go, that's because they are. We bought their trams, <laughs> you know? So that's how we ended up there. And then this current company, uh, we had a guy that had previous uh, uh, connections in, uh, in Minsk and Rostov. And that's how we built the initial team in each of those cities. It's all about relationships. Fantastic. So Rob, back, back, back to the other question. How, what, what additional tips do you have for overcoming a lack of trust and cohesion? Oh, um, I mean, I think it, it's, it's a few things. I think uh, one, you need to have folks on the ground that you trust and you've built a relationship up with. So as Pete said, I think even if you have distributed and remote teams, you need to spend some time on the ground there. Um, I was actually planning on spending a lot of time in Romania and Bulgaria this, this year, and thanks to COVID, haven't been able to, but my co-founders built teams and has people he trusts on the ground 
<clears throat> in Romania and Bulgaria. And so we have kind of leveraged those relationships. So I'd say one, it's you've got to have people on the ground. And as a founder, you have to spend time on the ground there as well. Um, you know, I hope travel restrictions loosen up this fall and then I'll be able to spend uh, more time there. Um, but I would say two, uh, clearly defined culture, rigorous interview process, uh, wherever possible, try before you buy. So part-time consulting is a great way to kind of assess whether or not there's a, a mutual fit. Um, and then I would say last, uh, uh, Oh, he needs to be muted. Uh, Marion, maybe? Uh, All right, done. I muted clearly, him. Clearly, somebody doesn't think what I'm talking about is that interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and, and then I would just say, lastly, um, we try to build really good personal relationships uh, on our team, and I think that helps build trust. And so, um, you know, as, as just one small micro example, we typically start off every, the first five minutes of every one of our team calls with just catching up personally and just socially and just talking about what's going on in the country or food or plans for the weekend, um, which may sound counterproductive, but I've just found that when the team gets to know each other personally and it builds a personal bond, you know, even if it's a 30 minute meeting, the next 25 minutes of the call are two to three times more productive if you spent that first five minutes, you know, kind of checking in personally. And so we try to do that and make sure that everybody's really getting to know each other as people. So we have folks from like, I think, uh, like 10 different countries, although we are focused in Romania. And um, having that kind of opportunity for folks to get to know each other personally uh, really helps in terms of building trust. Could, couldn't agree more with you, Rob, right? Like it's all about building a culture that respects people from everywhere as like equal employees of the, of the company and really caring about them. I think that that goes a long way over like some large enterprises which build remote teams and just see them as resources um, and not, not as human beings, right? Like, I mean, I think that's just like the basis of, of trust and functional relationships. I mean, that's what I've seen a lot also with working with teams in, in Romania and other places. Yeah, um, I find that there's uh, ways that you can you know, even when you have people from lots of different countries, there's definitely lots of stuff that people have in common. So I'm personally passionate about food. So are lots of people on the team. So, you know, we talk about things like Romanian food and Sarmale and stuff like that. Um, so food is one unifier. Sports is another unifier talking about, you know, soccer or football. Um, strangely on our team, everybody, everybody has dogs. So uh, everybody shares pictures of dogs together. So I think we just find lots of ways to build that kind of commonality and fabric uh, between the different people of the team. And that helps us a lot as well. Yeah, B bashing the American president is a very popular one lately. Yeah, you know, I will say though that uh, we, um, one thing that I think is definitely really important though is we try to focus on, on unifiers that are positive. So I try to avoid politics and at this point, COVID as well, like we just try to focus on positive and light stuff that connects everybody together. We have had sessions where we've gone deep, especially early in the epidemic talking about COVID. But I would say at this point, we try to focus on unifiers that are sort of positive. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of uh, distributed across multiple countries. Um, you know, if you wanna hire 10 people and you hire 10 people from you know, a bunch of different places, you know, there's language barriers, there's cultural barriers, there's communication barriers. So there's a lot to overcome, you know, versus just hiring 10 people in one place, right? Um, so, so it can be challenging sometimes. Um, and it's not the same as, you know, in the US, it's very common to hire 10 people from different places, but they've all lived here, you know? So there's some type of cultural grounding that that brings everybody together so so you can do it and you know and you can be successful at it and you can ha you have access to a much wider talent pool of course um but then you do have to spend a lot of time making sure there's not miscommunication um which can be challenging sometimes time zone coordination is also an issue as well and time zone co i mean and i mean you make a joke it's like the eu right you grab an italian a german a swede 
you know, in a poll and say, and, and say, and a British guy and say, okay, where are we going for dinner tonight and at what time? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and, and then you wait for when everybody shows up so you can agree on a time, but where everybody shows up is different than the time that you picked for everybody exactly, still. Exactly. So, I mean, that's the joke. I grew up in Europe, so it's fun for me to joke around about the EU, but, uh, you know, so, so you can get there and the EU is more powerful than any individual country. Right. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but it takes a lot of effort, right. To make it all work. Uh, um, and, and it can be challenging. So, so Rob, you, you, you've spread your team across multiple places, right? Was this like wider talent availability or what was the, the driving decision factor on that? Yeah. We're an enterprise software company and we had a lot of complexity in what we had to build. So we had to staff up a team really quickly uh, with a bunch of different uh, skill sets. And we, you know, we definitely are focusing our non US team on uh, Romania and Bucharest and Cluj. But um, we have sort of opportunistically found some folks in other countries. Um, you know, we have uh, two people um, in Hidalgo and Argentina that have been amazing. And I actually think that I think you, if you have a few different time zones and you orchestrate it well, it can actually work really well for having like a flow of work going through time zones, which is really, really helpful. Um, but that said, I, you know, I agree with Pete, you definitely don't want to have, I mean, even though there's plenty of examples of companies that are fully remote and distributed, uh, like WordPress, you know, I agree. I think you don't have too many countries because it can get to be complicated. So we have what I would call, you know, two kind of centers and poles, which is, you know, the New York area, um, slash down to Atlanta and then, um, and then Romania. So we have kind of two centers and we do have a few folks opportunistically that are in other places, but it is good to have that focus. Yeah. I mean, what I would also say, right, like from lots of friends is if you start a team with a remote culture, like, like WordPress, it's just a very different company. Right? Like as, as Peter said earlier, right? like hiring somebody fresh out of university in a fully remote culture and like having somebody like handhold and educate them is just very tough. Right? Like, so while it's possible to run a fully remote team, it's probably a lot of it is like, it's just a very different team and you can't like just like randomly plan for that. So Rob, since you like uh, have like teams inclusion, it's shared about like how you bring people on board. Do you, uh, do you look currently for more people? And if so, where people on this call could go to find out more if, you're, if you have open positions, just to use that opportunity if you want more people in your team, then that is a good time to give it a shout out. Yeah, a year ago, so uh, our we love our team in Romania. Um, and we have particularly found Romania, I mean, it's a great source of enterprise tech talent, in particular around machine learning. Um, so to answer a question from several questions ago, uh, you know, why did we pick Romania? Uh, you know, a big reason was UiPath. So, you know, um, UiPath is an, an exceptional automation company. And we thought, huh, so they built up in Romania. Uh, there's probably a lot of good, uh, you know, AI and machine learning talent there. So that was a big re one of the big reasons why we picked Romania. Um, I will also say, as, as I mentioned, you know, we... Uh, I love food and believe it or not, we actually did check out the food from a bunch of different countries and Romanian food just looked awesome. And, you know, we could see ourselves spending a lot of time there. So that was another reason why we picked Romania. Um, in terms of uh, working with us, I would say, if you're interested in engaging, my email is r at backbone.ai. We've done most of our hiring already for this year. A year ago, we were, you know, three people um, with some sketches on the back of napkins and stuff. And, you know, just, you know, some, a very limited product coded. We're now over 30 people. Um, so we've done most of our hiring for this year, but we, we plan to double in size next year. And Romania is a very important part of our growth plans. And, you know, we love our team in Romania and look forward to expanding it. So just send me an email and, you know, we can start conversations. I love it that Romanian food is now a key factor to attract international entrepreneurs. Um, so well, we definitely. I, I, I built a previous company um, with an engineering team in the UK, uh, specifically in Reading. And the team was exceptional. Um, and I've lived in England for five or six years, but I don't love British food. 
Um, and so uh, the, I, I hate to say it, but you know, if we're going to spend a bunch of time in country, we want it to be a place where the food looks awesome. And, um, you know, Romanian food looks awesome. So that was one of probably 15 different factors why we picked Romania. All right. Hope, hope next time when travel is like possible again, I'll, I'll, we'll take you out to a nice restaurant in Cluj. Anyway, let's go to the, <clears throat> let's go to the next question from the, from the audience. So how, how do you integrate a new team member in a remote team? What are some best practices that you guys have learned? Well, I'll, do, I'll take this one. Well, you know, it depends the, the face of the product and the company, right? In the early days, you know, we're hiring pretty seasoned people that you can just throw into the mix, um, you know, later on the line, down the line. And, and we have a very unique company at, in country because we have a lot of security and compliance, you know, and people are very unaccustomed to that. So we have to like train people you know, on our processes. So we usually have smaller teams. We have regular standups, very well-defined, uh, uh, you know, scope of features, things like that. And you start people small and then start to integrate them, um, you know, for where we are right now. The biggest challenge we have is security and compliance issues. You know, people are not used to spending 30, 40% of their time having their code checked, you know, going through security reviews, you know, uh, going through like a, a change review board, things like that. You know, we run kind of like a bank, but we want startup kind of people. So a lot of it is really the cultural uh, integration uh, of our style and the why behind it. And that's really the value of the company is that we build things that way. Very cool. Yeah, I would just kind of teasing out a, a, a topic that, uh, that Pete mentioned, which is, um, at least at this point, we have no plans to hire people fresh out of school. Um, I think, as you mentioned earlier, Philip, I think, you know, bringing somebody on board that's totally green, just coming out of school. I think that that kind of person should probably be in an office working with people every day. I think it's a harder for someone like that to go into a remote environment, especially on the enterprise side where, you know, as Pete mentioned, there's lots of security issues and stuff like that. So, um, we're typically going to look for uh, people that have uh, already built up an experience base and in a company that looks high quality. So um, we're, we're onboarding somebody from Genpak, for example, uh, based in Romania. And I think that we certainly look for folks that um, already have a certain solid foundation level of experience. Yeah, we had a Moldovan woman working for us at Sappho, started in QA while she was in college. Uh, then moved into being an integration analyst and then product manager and then became our best product manager at the company, right? And, and that type of art doesn't usually happen without, you know, in-person office yeah. of experience, right? Um, so, so it's interesting, right? And, and, you know, in these COVID times, you know, a lot of people are trying to process how to do that right now. Um, and I think it takes a lot of sort of in-person time like we're doing online here. But I don't know. It's new for everybody, I think. Pete, yeah. that's, a great, that's a great point. Um, we actually, one of our biggest stars on the team is somebody, an Argentinian guy that started in QA. So uh, I just want to give a shout out to QA people. Uh, I think they make uh, exceptional product people because they're extremely detail oriented and understand the details of the features. I'll take a, I'll take a former QA person over um you know sort of high level people uh any day in terms of uh making you know building them into good product managers yes i i can second that and the good thing is about qa people when they switch roles also when they switch to engineering they later build way better relationships between departments because they tell people that it's like you can't be angry at the person filing the bug just because they filed the bug so usually this kind of cross departmental switches increase like cultural understanding for different roles a lot in my experience so i think i've, I've always i always like moving people around departments like from product or from uh, from from qa or from engineering to product builds a lot of empathy um and, and helps a lot in many many cases yeah um, the problem is you can't you can have uh you can have an engineering person go into marketing but you can't really have like a marketing person <laughs> go start doing code reviews <laughs> I, I, I was a while ago chatting with like some senior Facebook folks 
And they said like at the early days of the company, they thought the engineers would do everything better than everybody else. Right? Like, so engineering would run HR, engineering would run marketing. Um, and they figured out that they're smarter than everybody else. But after a while, like even they realized that there is actually a good reason why you have specialization and some skills and like, not like first principles reasoning doesn't necessarily build you like a great marketing plan. So <laughs> yeah, uh, Google was the same way. Um, and I can't, I, I, in my spare time, I help uh, founders uh, build their companies. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen founders say like, oh, you know, like I could do sales or I could build a financial model. If I can code, I could build a financial model. And um, it doesn't always turn out well. Yes, I've, I've seen that happening. And I've been, I've been more than, I've been like in my first company, I've been very guilty of that as well, thinking that I can like do everything better than everybody else. So thank God over time, I met some amazing people in those domains and that helped me a lot to realize that, that there is a reason why, why people do like certain specializations. Anyway, um, the next question that we have is, how do you make sure that you deliver the same quality no matter the team location and cultural differences? Peter, do you want to go first again? Well, like I said, I, I like to do same location, same culture, right? Um, but even within that, you have issues. I mean, come on. We had an office in Cluj, and I would get the message, you're all going to laugh. Well, these people are taking Orthodox Easter, and these people are taking, uh, you know, uh, Latin Easter, and these people actually speak Hungarian, and these other <laughs> you know what I mean? So it is kind of funny. But yeah, you know, it's interesting because people for quality, especially, there is a very big cultural aspect to it, right? And, and you know, you really have to set your standards. And, and the thing about, you know, emerging companies and emerging products is the standard shift. You know, in the early days, you just want something schlocked together and demonstrable. Um, and, and, and so I think the real key is to come up with terms, right? And especially with Slavic cultures, right? There's a very, you know, high degree of diligence, you know, and, and edge case resolution. So for example, even at this company, we came up with a term, we call it minimal viable demo, MVD. So sometimes we're like, we need an MVD, right? Which, you know, in Silicon Valley, say, give me a prototype of X, right? Um, but, you know, in some cultures, you ask for that, you're going to get a three-month evaluation of all the different options and all the different edge cases. And so a big part of it is, is a very clear definition of what you want, right? And educating the team what that is and then shifting, you know, uh, that with those definitions over time are building on top of them, right? Because now we can't ship anything unless it's perfect, right? And it's totally secure. In the early days, that wasn't the case. Very, very insightful. I've definitely seen that also when working with different cultures that the requirements of a quality bar to ship is is completely different, right? Like, I mean, when you work like from like a country like Japan or so on that is extremely quality conscious, where for them like a, a demo is like a perfect product uh, that is like the quality standard of like a production release in like in the US or something like that. I, I have seen that this can lead to quite interesting clashes in the teams if you have a different definition of what the quality bar for a certain version is. All right, Rob, Rob what's your, what's your uh, tips for the audience? You have to measure everything a lot more to make sure there's a shared understanding of what done and quality is. And so I would say with international, remote, or whatever you want to call it, distributed engineering teams, there is increased pressure on product uh, to uh, define the product clearly and define what working means um, and how we will measure the um, reliability of the product as well. So I would say that uh, more work from product, clear definition of standards, and then you probably need to do, at least initially, um, some checking. But I, I don't know, I found that um, that's just kind of inherent in working with engineering teams wherever you are. So I found that, you know, we had to do lots of QA and quality testing, even on US teams for, for very different reasons. How, how much do you see in like your, your respective spaces? How, how much do you see a challenge out of the engineers not being in market? I mean, do you see that also in like, because in, in consumer, I heard a lot of people saying that it's a challenge in, in there, it's becoming more debatable. 
do you see a challenge for people being away from the country where I suppose most of your customers are? Mm -hmm. Pete, you want to take that first? You want me to take that? Well, we have a global footprint. So like our first customer was in Saudi Arabia. So we don't really have that, that issue, yeah. right? Um, and actually, you know, for some of our customers being in, uh, you know, the Moscow time zone is actually really convenient. It's only one hour off of Dubai, for example, where we have an office. So with this company, we haven't really had that issue. Um, and, you know, we've been fortunate that people are pretty flexible about the time zone they work in so they can join calls later here and there. We don't abuse it. Um, I will say at my last company, we were told the engineers, hey, you should join any call you want, right? But, you know, it's at 11 p.m. their time, so they don't do it, right? Yeah. So off to you, Rob. Yeah. We usually have customer facing people that are in the same, as close to the same market as possible as the customers are selling to. Um, so for example, we're a supply chain automation company. So we're dealing with fortune 500s that have supply chain people. And they're often, for example, people in places like Birmingham and Atlanta. So um, what we do is we have uh, uh, two inc incredible team members, one in Birmingham, one in Atlanta. So I've always believed that Sales works best when the person doing the selling looks and feels as much as possible like the person they're selling to. Um, and so having folks locally on the ground in Birmingham and Atlanta is a huge competitive advantage for us. So they're kind of, at least initially, they're the user interface with um, the customer and that works great. Um, behind them are kind of the more technical and data people. And so we build a credibility initially with the local people but I think over time, you know, so initially it is a, does this person look and feel like me? But then, you know, that works pretty well for the first few weeks. But then, you know, after that, it's really about results. And, you know, we, I'd like to think we're really crushing it for our customers. And at the end of the day, that's what they care about our results. And so it's at a point now where we'll have people from, you know, Cluj and Bucharest and Hidalgo on the phone and, I don't think our customer really cares. Like we're delivering amazing product for them quickly and amazing data results. And I don't think they really care where it comes from. Yeah, no, and especially on Zoom, I mean, that's like even less relevant than before for sure. So um, I have like a question, like also for both of you, since you guys said like early on, really the, like going, meeting people face to face, you said that, that earlier Pete and like, Rob, you said like also like really like having good meals and sharing like nice experiences with people. What, what are you guys doing with your remote teams to have fun during those times? Um, uh, oh, since Pete, since, uh, since you started the last few questions, you want me to start first on this one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Um, Pete is thinking he doesn't have fun. He doesn't know how to answer this one. Oh, so yes, he does. Fun. Yes, he does. Um, I, so I, backing up to a, uh, sort of let me make a statement then I'll answer the question which is I think culture is extremely important and a good culture can be a uh, strategy any day and I think that it isn't that hard to build a unifying culture in a company when you have people from different countries if you put some thought into how you do it so for example our culture at Backbone is very I mean our, our values are up on our website um, customer oriented very fast um, very results oriented, very flat, not hierarchical. Um, but I think it's possible to laugh a lot and love the people you work with and also get a huge amount of stuff done. I think they're actually very complimentary. Conversely, I think if you hate the people you work with, the hate you company that you're at, you're not going to get as much done in its short term. So I want people to love working at our company. And so I think having fun is important. And I think that, um, I've always hated stuff like, uh, foosball tables and ping pong tables because you have these big tech companies that think that wow just because we have a foosball table people are happy working here and i think that's bullshit i think that um when i think of fun i think there's lots of levels so i think fun starts with clear goals um managing towards those goals that unify everybody together as a company we're doing pretty good on that we need to be better um making sure everybody's role is clear um, eliminating conflict points whenever there's conflict on the team, um, having an open environment where everybody feels like they can voice their opinion and it's heard. And if it's good ideas, they're adopted. Um, and I think that is actually an underappreciated part of fun 
Like I want people to have fun and really love and feel fulfilled working in our company all day long. Um, we do some what are more considered like stereotypical fun stuff. Like um, obviously we can't all go out and grab, uh, you know, beers together, but um, we do stuff online all the time. Like um, we talk about personal stuff. We talk about food. Um, we've done some fun stuff like, you know, sharing pictures of dogs. We did, it turns out that a lot of our team loves heavy metal. So we had a heavy metal day where everybody, you know, dressed up uh, heavy metal style. Um, so we're constantly doing stuff like that um, to promote bonds between people. We, you know, and I try to make sure we laugh a lot on the calls. And I think that really helps as well. So I don't think we, you know, I, I don't, I think a lot of the traditional fun stuff like going and grabbing beers, I mean, it's nice, but it's kind of, uh, in my mind, it's a little bit forced and bullshit. I like to create an environment where people are having fun in all of the work that they're doing and how they're working with other people. I, I'd love to see the heavy metal team building pictures on Zoom. So that, that sounds like a lot of fun to me. So I definitely, definitely want to see that one. Uh, so that, that's a good sharing for, uh, for after this call. Uh, Pete, how, how, how about how are you having you fun with your team? Well, you know, for our San Francisco team, we got rid of our office. And uh, so now we have a, a thrice weekly Zoom call where we all bullshit. Um, you know, and then for the remote teams, we used to have a leads meetup that happened every two months somewhere in Europe. Uh, and then we would have a, uh, an annual everybody meetup, right? Um, but of course, uh, those have been canceled. Um, and I gotta tell you the company, we miss them. We have not transitioned. We, we did an online uh, leads meetup, you know, it was uh, I think four hours or five hours over two nights for me and daytime for them, but it wasn't the same. So we haven't been able to transition uh, uh, to sort of like the traditional fun. But you know, as I get older, I, I am a believer that, you know, you should work at work and have fun on your own time, right? Uh, in some ways, you know, if everyone's in their 20s, yeah, you know, you're, everyone wants to go have fun, but you know, a lot of our staff have children, you know, spouses, you know, for them fun is, is stopping work at six and going and spending time with their families, right? More so than having an obligation, so. But I do miss the in-person, you know, we were, we had a meetup in Istanbul, we had a meetup in Barcelona, you know, we had like cool other areas we were all gonna meet up uh, and those are gone now. Um, and I hope they come back at some point soon. You know, I think, I think they're called super spreader events, right? <laughs> when you bring people from a bunch of countries and jam them in a hotel and have them get drunk, so. Who knows, right? Yes, please don't organize a super spread event right now. That's the last thing we need. Um, no, I mean, actually interesting to your, to your point, right? Like, so we actually, as a, as a company where I'm right now at Grab, we moved our half yearly leadership conference online. And actually it was like almost better than the in-person one because we got like amazing people coming. We got like the former British prime minister, Tony Blair as a guest speaker and Ariana Huffington. Which, like, if we would have done it like on site in Singapore, we probably wouldn't have gotten them to come. But remotely, we could like get those kind of guys like joining our, our leadership session. So we've actually seen like a silver lining, um, and similar thing, right? Like that we're doing this kind of here, right? Like we wouldn't like be able to do this in Cluj. I mean, you guys wouldn't fly over to Cluj for this. So I do, I do see there's like some of these things with it, with teams that that make it easier. And what you said, right? Like they can see their families. They don't need to travel around so much. So there's there's some some pro, um, benefits on that as well. And also what Rob said, also want to strongly, strongly second that we're like the best way for having fun is letting people do amazing work, right? Like, I mean, a foosball table doesn't get you to a, a shitty job, right? Like, I mean, if your job sucks and you hate your guts and you work like on 20 year old technology that you don't like, then even the best football table can't, uh, can't cure that. So that's for sure too. Um, yeah. I, I like yeah. to have an environment where people, um, you know, early in my career, uh, I worked at some big companies like Accenture and I friggin' hated it. And I felt like I had better ideas than my bosses. And I, I don't know if that was true, but um, I never felt like I could express my ideas. So one of the things that we really try to do is foster an environment where everybody in the meetings can, you know, recommend ways that things can be better, or things could be doing differently, or maybe let's focus on this. And I think that kind of fun for me feels more authentic to a company. And obviously it benefits us, but we like it to be an environment where everybody, you know, even if they've only been on a team for two weeks, 
um, can make suggestions and tell the CEO and founder when he's wrong and I'm wrong often. Um, and I think that that is for me a more authentic and sustainable way for people to have fun. I mean, we do that, the fun light stuff too, but I think if people really feel fulfilled, they love the people they work with, um, that's really important. I mean, I'll give you a good example. We had an engineering leader that we onboarded earlier this year. Um, he was starting to ramp up and, and frankly, I got some, I went and checked in with a bunch of the engineers and the engineers just hated him. Um, and so, uh, we, uh, uh, we offboarded him in two weeks. Um, so, uh, the engineers really did enjoy working with this person. And I sat in on a few calls where I got, I really felt like the engineers were right. So we offboarded this leader in two weeks. And I think that kind of stuff is just as important for a fun work environment, if that makes sense. That's a, that's a really good point. It reminds me of this story when I was young and I was like maybe 25 and a friend of mine joined the Boston Consulting Group. It's like BCG, like a big uh, consulting group. Uh, and then I asked him, I'm like, Steve, you know, you don't know anything. We don't know anything. How do you show up at like these big companies and, and tell them what to do? And he goes, it's really easy. We go in, we find everybody our age and we ask them what's fucked up. And then we write it up and give it to management. <laughs> That's good. And I like, by the way, I missed American American terms, Rob, right? Like when like firing somebody is called like offboarding, which sounds much okay. nicer. Well, I just sounded kind of like an asshole thing to say to say firing, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I just mentioned a really funny thing. Man, Americans have a lot of weird terms. And so like just a funny little aside. We were finding that sometimes like the Romanians and the Argentinians are like, what the hell are these Americans talking about? Because you have all these like American phrases that just make no sense. So like uh, we actually have a glossary for Americanisms now. So like there's all this weird stuff like throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, you know, our, uh, you know our, our offshore people are like, what the hell are these people talking about? So we actually have a glossary of Americanisms so that they can, you know, know what some of the Americans are saying sometimes. All right, so we have one question from Justinian who um, sent me his question in. Thank you very much for, for that. So uh, what he's asking is there's a huge competition on the HR front and attracting talents is, is super hard in IT. Um, what differenti differentiates you from compet competitors when hiring? And how do you convince people when uh, to join your company when it's a startup and the brand is not like consolidated yet? Is it the cool factor of the product or the technology? Is it culture or budget? Um, how do you do it? Pete, you want to go first? You want me to go first? Whichever you want. You go ahead. You're already talking. The war for talent's brutal. We often don't win. I think the way to win is a combination of building the personal relationship up with the candidate and deeply understanding what motivates them and trying to find candidates that are aligned with what we have to offer. Um, so we offer an amazing culture, flat organization, and the chance to work on really big, really complex uh, engineering and data problems that if we do our job right, will actually really affect how people get their food, how people get their paper um, and important day-to-day -day stuff. So. Traditionally, supply chain has been viewed as kind of boring, and I don't know why, but I think supply chain is fascinating because it impacts our daily lives in so many ways. So what we try to do when we're talking to candidates is kind of map, talk about the big, gnarly sort of data and engineering problems and then how they map to real world impact. And I think the combination of those two things, not for all candidates, but for candidates that I think would be a good fit for us, really resonates a lot. Uh, for us, you know, it's interesting. One, we're doing a cool company, you know, uh, cloud infrastructure. And then two, we're not outsourcing, right, to Minsk or Rostov on Don. That is core engineering, right? And, and everything is decided there. And then we do it Silicon Valley style. Um, and this is what we did in Prague as well. We bring people in and then we train them. This is how a Silicon Valley startup works. Uh, and to be able to sit in Rostov on Don and be part of the Silicon Valley company 
in, in an engineering organization, which is, which is run the same way it would in Mountain View or San Francisco, I think is appealing to people, right? And so a lot of our competition is go work at an outsourcer, right? Or go work at a crap startup that probably isn't gonna go anywhere or basically be part of something that's run just like a San Francisco startup would, right? But be in the driver's seat and, and learn what it's like. It's appealing. It's not appealing for everybody, but it has enabled us to attract good talent. And we have a high talent bar. Um, and, and then I'm lucky in that we, we pulled this off in Prague, you know, and now we're pulling it off again in, in a larger talent pool actually, right? Um, you know, so. I, I, I love it. You tell the candidates if they don't come work for you, their life will suck basically because you're like the, the, the only company with that bar, not le leaving like anything like back. Very nice. Yeah, who worked for the outsourcer? It's not fun. Everybody knows it, right? You get your little piece of work and your little thing, you know, and then they give you shit and then they lay you off because they don't care about you because you're not actually that important. You know, if anybody... If we lost five people, the company would be destroyed, right? It would take us months to rebuild, right? And people know how critical they are to this company. Yeah, well said, Pete. I totally agree. I think that um, I think a good question to ask yourself if you're a Romanian joining a non-Romanian company is how important am I and my team to the CEO? Do they even know who I am? So, you know, if you want to join one of these big publicly traded companies, it's probably great early in your career to you know, have some brand names on your resume and um, get that credibility. But, you know, at the end of the day, you don't really matter um, and you're highly expendable. Um, whereas for folks like Pete and I, like, you know, we know every team member by name, you know, in some cases, we, you know, I know their favorite food and, you know, where they went to school. You know, I know that, you know, one of our team members actually, you know, in his spare time produced a trance video that got a million views on MTV. So, or sorry, on YouTube. And so um, I think that if you want that personal connection and executives, they're gonna personally be interested in your career success and your advancement, then a startup obviously, in, in my opinion, is a much better option. Yeah, and, and, and the care that, that also Peter said, right? Like as a, as a smaller company, right? Like the, as both of you said, actually, like the, the care from the founders um, it's just like naturally at a company with like 20, 30 people is just a very different level than at a few hundred people company. Uh, all right, I think we have a, another question um, from Jen, uh, who is like one of the great proponents of the startup ecosystem in Cluj. So she has like helped many, many startups like get off the ground um, with her accelerator and her venture fund. So uh, I think we've like addressed part of this. But I think also the, the other part of the question is right, like you said, like how, how do you get like people from like the initial integration of, um, of employees and like the first few weeks are really critical for attention. How, how do you balance not overloading people with making sure they feel integrated, motivated and engaged in those first few weeks? Um, and this is something that, that she's been like struggling with in, since new projects has been converted from in office to remote. Um, have you have you seen that, and do you have ways to address that? Uh, I'll admit we were lazy about it. You know, we basically it's sink or swim, American idiom. You know, uh, you're either you know fitting in or you're not in the early days. I mean, we spend more time on it now. And actually, I heard something really great last night. You know, because I was doing my calls. Uh, you know, to. Uh, to Eastern Europe uh, and one guy said, oh yeah, we just, you know, onboarded somebody and they said, hey, this is the best onboarding experience I've ever had. And I'm like, wow, you know, that feedback compared to a year ago, which was there's no onboarding at all. <laughs> you know, I'm just given tickets. <laughs> I'm like, oh, we really did well. I mean, look, in the early days, it's really, really hard, you know, to, to spend the time. And I know there are founders that spend all the time you know, in the early days to get their culture right, get people in right, make sure they work out. And, and that was, I, I'll, I'll admit that wasn't us, uh, but you know, but it makes me happy. I mean, look, the company is only 20 months old at this point, uh, a year and a half in, you know, that people are giving us that kind of feedback it makes me feel good, you know. Um, so, so Pete, how, ma how many people sink? How many people swim after six weeks? You know, it was, we, this company was too much. We had maybe a 20% thrash rate, um, but most people thrashed out early. 
So, you know, after six weeks, you know, we have a very high retention rate. Uh, but, you know, it's just not fair to people. It's not fair to us. It's not fair to the team to do it that way. Uh, so we need to, we need a better balance, right? We just had too much thrash at this company for the first six to nine months, I think. Um, so it's nice to actually be much more stable. Uh, so in hindsight, that was an error on our part. We should have put more time into it. I was just, you know, juggling a million things, right? <laughs> you know, um, I'm sure Rob did a better job than I am. He's much more uh, touchy feely than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rob, as a touchy feely, how did you manage? <laughs> touchy feely is another Americanism, just so everybody knows. That, <laughs> that means being sensitive, to be clear. <laughs> 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 probably clarify what that means. Um, previous companies, uh, uh, sort of voluntary, or I guess you call it forced attrition, whatever you want to call it, uh, was single digits percent, low single digits. It's been a little bit higher um, for us. Um, but I think some of that is because we have uh, changed and evolved quite a bit in what we're doing. Um, so there, ha it has been a little bit higher. I would also say that we have... Um, we experimented with a bunch of different countries and I think we're kind of just frankly focusing on fewer and fewer countries. Um, so that's been responsible for a little bit of the turnover. But uh, I would say if there's one theme for ensuring, you know, the continued success and onboarding, it's a lot of communication. Um, so whenever key members of the team are um, onboarding, I usually do one-on-ones with them weekly for the first, at least the first few weeks. Um, and certainly when we do bigger team calls, I check in on them to see how they're doing. Um, and then I spend, even if I don't necessarily have direct contact with people, um, we do regular reviews, I would say monthly and often as frequently as biweekly, um, on every individual team member where I'll talk to the team leads and I'll go team member by team member and ask how they're doing. Um, are they blocked? Is there anything we could be doing better, et cetera? Um, we also have things like uh, an Ask Rob Anything Slack channel. So I try to also provide lots of open communication channels so people can ask questions. We do all hands every few weeks. So we do a ton of different stuff to improve the communication and transparency with everybody. Um, but you know, it's you know, a, kind of a really interesting point that hasn't been mentioned and I think we're pretty much out of time. And that's, um, I think an important thing that everybody should realize when they're joining a startup, um, especially remote, is um, obviously we've talked about a lot of the benefits. One of the benefits is the chance to evolve and move quickly throughout your career. But if to, to answer a, Jennifer's question a little bit more, I think it's really important when you join a startup to think that whatever success looks like for you in the first few months may be different than what it looks like a year or two out. So the upside of working for a startup is the chance to evolve and grow quite a bit and not be stuck in a stagnant, boring role for five years. But you also have to keep in mind that you constantly have to evolve as a person. So Pete has had a bunch of, I think it was six great exits and wins. And one, and you know, I've had not as many, but one of the things that's constantly struck me is that everybody, even up to folks like the CEO, like Pete and I, when you're working at a startup, if you do things well, it's going to grow fast. And that means that every single member of the team, including us, people like Peter and I, we need to constantly be evolving and upping our game. And I think the same is true for anybody that joins a startup, which is think about, you know, improving a little bit every day, constantly throughout your journey. Yeah. We went from 80 to 80 in six months. Yeah. Last year. And that's where we had like that 20, 30% level of thrash. And what Rob said about the all hands is really, really important. You have to have those crew meetings. Yeah. Really, really fantastic advice. Us. All right, guys. So with that, we have uh, come to the to the end of our hour. I want to really say a big, big thank you for being like direct and honest, right? Like really sharing the experiences you've gained on the on the battlefield, which is running many startups. Um, so I hope that a lot of the founders or a lot of the engineers or product managers, whatever they may be on the call can leverage those when building their own companies or being part of a, of a team themselves. So I do really, really appreciate your, your time and uh, dialing in with us from, uh, from the US. So really, really awesome. And um, I want to also ask the audience, so Vlad is putting uh, two polls live, um, which I think it will be both on, on Zoom and for those of you watching on, on Facebook, um, would love to have like a minute of your time to answer them. 
and uh, hope to see you all soon again. Thank you so much for your time. Really much appreciated. Uh, Philip, one last thing. Uh, so um, I'd encourage all of you to follow Peter and I on Twitter. I don't remember his handle. I'm at RMB. Uh, so I'd like this to be the start of kind of an ongoing conversation. So if you, if you all have any questions, just DM us anytime. Um, you know, we're all here to help. And so um, uh, DM us anytime with any questions you may have on any topics. And I guess I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Multumesque. La Rivière. <laughs> Thank you so much for the offer, guys. This is so kind of you. Be safe. Bye, everybody. Cheers.